Okay, folks, welcome to Lecture 7. Uh, we're shifting gears today. We're going to talk about money. And money is a macroeconomic phenomenon because we all use it. And we all mean millions of people in an economy. And, we, you know, macroeconomics is about common things. And one thing that people have in common is they use a means of payment. And that sort of connects us all. Right, so the connective tissue of, of an economy is the means of payment. So I'm going to talk about that, and I'm going to talk about the long run. Inflation is suddenly an interesting topic again. I grew up in a period of inflation in the United States, and in, in Germany, uh, the same thing was going on in Europe, even more so in the 1970s. And uh, for a long time, we thought we had conquered inflation. So it's come back, and it's important to understand why uh, inflation rears its head um, ultimately, we'll see that it has to do with the uh, central bank. But, you know, monetary policy, central bank, all these things are new to you maybe, and we have to learn them. So today is a really easy introduction to uh, money. And there are, some colleagues of mine don't uh, think money matters anymore. So it really, you can ignore it. So um, don't be surprised if you take courses with other colleagues or other uh, colleagues in different universities that may downgrade or downplay the role of money. Ultimately, money's still there. We're still using it to, to do what it does. And it, it, it hooks in in important ways to the way the central bank operates and the way uh, the price level moves over time. So regardless of what your, your favorite theory is, you have to somehow pay attention uh, to money. Now, I'll, I'll try to convince you why in a second. So today's relatively easy lecture because I try to make this easier than the last one. I mean, last time we, we sort of hit the peak of, of Ramsey, which is uh, admittedly a little bit challenging, but useful because later I will use the same machine to think about money. You can use the same Hamiltonian approach to think about money as well as capital and other things. So I'm going to try to motivate that and you'll see that um, the same ideas come into play again and again and again. Okay? Uh, I'll review last time briefly some very brief remarks on Ramsey Koopmans, Cass Koopmans again, RCM or RCK, sorry. Um, then I'll start talking about money, because money to me is much more uh, interesting at, at the moment and why we use it, what is it, why uh, do we use this money and not some other money. Um, and how to put it in macro models. It's going to have to do with the interest rate in the end. It's going to have to do with the, the nominal interest rate, the opportunity cost of holding money. Okay, so if you, if you choose to hold money, you're forsaking or foregoing the, the possibility of putting that money in a, in, a, in a bank account that might give you I, an interest rate. Okay, and where that interest rate comes from is... Uh, you know, you can take it as given or you can try to understand it in a general equilibrium. We'll try to do both over the next few uh, lectures. And ultimately, in the, uh, at the end of the course, we'll see that the central bank basically has most of the control over the nominal interest rate, certainly in the short run and um, in the long run uh, as well. And what that means is basically we're going to be designing a way of thinking about connecting the short run with the long run. Okay, so does anybody, did anybody watch the, the video? Does anybody recognize this gentleman? Yeah. This is David. Yeah, so David Hume, a philosopher who thought he, he thought economics was kind of trivial. Uh, trivial. <laughs> so David Hume uh, wrote um, about philosophy, moral philosophy, which he and Adam Smith, uh, I guess, his student, uh, eventually cooked up into a, into a way of thinking about the way the world organizes uh, its resources. But really, Adam Smith did that. David Hume sort of just gave, gave rise to some ideas. He wrote a few pages about money in his famous essay, On Money. <laughs> and then he just kind of said, uh, let's finish with that. Uh, the Scots are very good at money. Um, and that's probably one reason why this is such a very uh, important guy for us. Um, he basically wrote that money in itself, and he was talking about gold back then, because gold was money. People were starting to discover banknotes, but they were kind of dodgy. It's a little bit like internet, like uh, Bitcoin. And he said money is really not uh, the subject of commerce, but it's actually um, 
there are much more important things going on there, like how we increase our standards of living, but money is a way of making this process of making ourselves wealthy uh, easier, okay? So the gold is valuable only because it enables us to exchange with each other. It's a, it's a vehicle uh, for making trade more easy. He said it's the oil or the grease that, that smooths the, 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 the interlocking uh, you know, teeth of, of gears uh, rather than the gears themselves or the, the power that's, that's driving the gears. So that, that's really pretty deep for, for the mid 18th century. Pretty cool. And um, when I first read this, I just couldn't believe that this guy said this. And this is, in a sense, we haven't come very far in our thinking about money. Uh, because ultimately, if you believe that uh, statement, then it turns out the quantity of money doesn't matter. And he actually goes on in the essay to say, all that gold coming in from Latin America at the time, it was being colonized by Spain. They were bringing the gold to Spain. It was coming into the, the port of Cadiz and flooding the market with gold. And people felt like they were richer. But in the end, they weren't, because the gold was being spent on goods and services. And that was driving the prices up. And ultimately, after all the dust settled, the price of goods in terms of gold was higher. Um, the people had some gold, but you can't eat the gold. I mean, you can maybe wear it. But in terms of its actual measure of wealth, um, if the price of all the land goes up in terms of gold, then what's the, what's the use of the gold? So it's just a, it's kind of a common sense. So philosophers are pretty good at this, thinking outside the box, thinking uh, outside the box on very basic things. So he really scored a big, a big point uh, with all of us today. We still talk about Hume. We talk about it for many reasons, because if a country buys more than it sells, it ha in that world, they paid for it with gold. So the receiving country exported the goods and got the gold. What happens to price of goods in the country that exported? Uh, the prices go up, all things equal. So he saw that as a mechanism of equilibrating balance of payments uh, differences. And that's still a, an idea that people talk about today. Um, so this guy is not David Hume in his younger manifestation. It's a different guy. Um, it's kind of the father of monetary economics. And he, Jevons was um, an English economist who basically wrote the following. He thought that uh, money had several functions, and we should write those down and think hard about them because they characterize money. So he described money. And he thought about it as a medium of exchange. And that's really one of the most important ideas of today's lecture. It's a way of trading what I produce for what I would like to have um, without having to find a match with the person uh, who's selling me the goods. Okay, So if I'm a barber, I don't have to sell a haircut to a guy who's making a saddle for my horse. I can go through some third way and save a lot of energy and try to negotiate the price of my haircut. Or, you know, we have a common medium of exchange. That's also kind of a standard of payment idea. Okay, So we all use the same price. We've eliminated the number of prices because all the, the pairs of prices can be reduced uh, um, to, a, to, a, to a single denominator. right? So medium exchange, allowing for the exchange to take place, standards of payment, a way of uh, reducing the information uh, content you need in a price vector of all the different goods. Okay, it's also a way of holding wealth. You can actually hold wealth into the, carry it into the future, just like in the diamond model, the way the consumers were purchasing capital, right, with with their labor basically, and using it to enable them to consume. That was an economy without money. You can put money into that economy; it doesn't change anything. We're literally, okay, so. As a store of value, you could even think, well, maybe we don't need capital. We could use money as a store of value. Okay, and that's perfectly okay, but you'll see later that there's a little bit of a problem. You have to make sure that people believe that the money that you give them is going to be worth something when they turn around and have to spend it, because you may be out of the picture. It's also a means of deferred payment. So you can also write contracts in money in terms of value, in terms of money in the future, maybe five years from now, like a contract that makes me pay uh, so and so much uh, euros per um, kilowatt hour of, of, of energy. So you can, you can use it as a way of pricing future goods and future commitments. 
these are really descriptions of what money are, uh, is, and not really what the feature of money is that makes it money, because you know, you're describing some of the functions, and we know that all these functions are important. Um, this is my favorite, okay? <laughs> Does anybody know who this guy is? <laughs> if you're from the United States, you might. If, you're, if you've had parents who watched this guy on television or... Marx. Yeah, and not Karl Marx, Groucho Marx. <laughs> okay, and he and, his, he and his brothers were comedians, and they had great movies that were out in the 1930s. Groucho Marx um, lost a lot of money in the stock market crash of 1929. He lost his fortune. He was a, actually a... A silent uh, movie, um, also a, a comedian guy who made lots of money and, like everyone else, invested heavily, like people who invest in cryptocurrencies, lost a lot of money, came back and made lots of millions because he had talent, so it didn't matter so much. What did he say? He said, money is um, anything that frees you from doing stuff you don't like. <laughs> and since uh, he, I just like doing everything, money is pretty handy. Okay, so it's something that everybody needs. <laughs> um, he, he also <laughs> said some other stuff, which is pretty funny, which is money, and this is kind of a general statement, uh, money can't buy you happiness, but it certainly lets you choose your own form of misery. <laughs> okay, so um, in a sense, what he's kind of telling us is that money is judged as uh, how much utility it brings to you. Okay, so how much, how much is it worth to free the complexity of transactions? Uh, how much is it worth to me in terms of happiness to have access to my bank account through my credit card or from my debit card? So a debit card is really access to your money. It's not necessarily money. The credit card and the debit card are not money per se, but they give you access to means of payment because the bank goes with this, uh, this uh, certification that you've used your credit card and takes money from your account, and that's when the money is actually spent, right? And uh, you may borrow it for a while, you may have to pay some interest. All these things have to do with utility. So we come back and think about money and the fundamental sense, we're gonna think about utility, the, 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 the extent to which utility is increased by having this stuff around. Because if you don't have much money in terms of what it can buy you, life may be less comfortable. You may have to run around more. You'll have to spend it more rapidly because um, there's not enough of it around. So and that's in one sense, think about um, why did Charle Charlemagne, uh, Karl der Große, Charles, the, whatever his name is, <laughs> Charles the Great, uh, Charlemagne, I think was what everybody calls him in the United States. So the, he basically conquered a lot of countries in the ninth century and imposed the silver standard. He made all the conquered countries use silver and they were using gold. But gold was really hard to find, so it was really hard to do transactions with little micro pieces of gold. By making it silver, he actually increased the um, availability to a transactions mechanism or a transactions um, technology that made it easier to, to, to engage in commerce. And he basically put his, his face on the coin so you knew it was a, it was a livre, it was a real, it was a, it was a currency unit that you could accept, so the recognition was there. So this is an interesting, fa it's not a fable, it's a fact, that when he took over places, he said, you have, to, you have to accept this. You can accept other things in payment, but you have to accept this, legal tender. So the government steps in and makes you accept this stuff. And they still do that today. If you look at any country's currency, you know, it'll say something like, this is legal tender for all debts, or this in some foreign language, but implicitly, if someone engages in transactions, she or he has the right to use money to pay for that stuff. Money that is legal tender. Okay, it's not all kinds of money. So you can't, you don't have the right to use cryptocurrencies to pay. If you can find someone who will accept it, fine. But if you come to someone with a euro in Germany and you try to pay for your bill, he can't say, or she can't say no, right? It's a, it's a, it's a legal tender. In the United States, same thing. So that's, one way of thinking about the government's involvement in this game is trying to force people to converge on some expectation that this stuff is okay, we can use it in the next period and the next period. So it's a little bit like a Ponzi scheme. It's a little bit like a game. And if we're focused on the good equilibrium, everything's fine. Right? Yeah. So given these assumptions, like the only thing needed would be 
history of government intervention of legal basis to make cryptocurrency the form of payment? Um, yeah, but if the government does that, the government in, sort of is on the hook for the validity of the crypto system, the crypto payments, um, uh, you know, all the weaknesses and strengths of it. Uh, and we know there are some weaknesses, especially when, when people start platforms that aren't covered by reserves and you can have disasters like we've had in the past month. Um, the government could do anything. The government could make me take this uh, these, the, this tea as a means of payment. You know, if the government can enforce it, then it's fine. It's hard to enforce, so people try to run away a lot of times. So, in, in fact, some in some uh, I remember in the 1970s, people tried to pay with with certain types of coins, and people refused to accept them for whatever reason. Um, you can, you can do things that can't be supervised, but nowadays we have more and more control. Large transactions are usually monitored, so it's really hard to, to get around this, but um, the government would have to intervene, and the government probably doesn't want to do that. Yeah. I think El Salvador has tried to yeah. cryptocurrency. Yeah, yeah, that's right, and it's a big disaster for, because, uh, well, the value, the store of value function is, has been damaged because cryptocurrencies have, in all their values, but especially Bitcoin, they use Bitcoin as uh, lost about two thirds of its value in the meantime, even more. So um, a lot of people lost a lot of wealth. If you think El Salvador needs to import in dollars and they have to convert those, those Bitcoins back to dollars, ouch, right? So anyway, that's a, a great story, but I'm not <laughs> gonna talk about it. But I will talk about this. Money is something that we use and in a modern economy, whether you're in the United States or China or Japan, Germany, um, the money that we use today has a practical aspect, which is you can locate it on the balance sheet of banks. Okay, so that's an important fact that you should remember for the rest of your lives. Okay, it's, it's not just it's not just <laughs> just for this final exam. This is this is very important, right? So where would you find it? So. What a balance sheet is should be clear to all of you. It's really one of our, it's our bread and butter, how we, we communicate with each other. What is the wealth? What is your wealth? What is the wealth of your firm? What is the wealth of your, your government, the bank you're doing business with? You know, you have assets and liabilities, and when you subtract the liabilities from the assets, you have something that resembles net worth, and that's an indicator of the, of the, of the value at some sort of market price of the enterprise. Okay, so a company has positive net worth, means it has book value that's positive, and hopefully the markets will see that, but this is about the accounting part, so this is really easy to see, right? The central bank, I have to define it, but think of the commercial banks. You all have a bank account somewhere. You've got, you've got access to some payment, medium of payment that you pay your rent with. You don't pay your rent in cash, probably. Most of you, I would imagine, have a, have a checking account, a bank account, and you, you have an automatic transfer, and where would you find that, right? Well, first off, you'd look at the commercial banks, and then you'd look at their balance sheet. Now, your bank account is on what side of the balance sheet of a commercial bank? Should be on the liabilities, right? And indeed, we've got it right there. You can see it, okay? And that's not the only stuff that you use and we consider money, but it is the biggest chunk of money. So in this country, it's about 90% of all the money. Cash is n not much. If you go to Denmark, it's 2%. 98% of all the transactions are taking place in terms of bank, transfers of bank accounts, ownership of bank accounts. Okay, so where's the rest? Where's the rest of the money? The money in your pocket, the cash in your pocket, the currency. Can you find it? On the other side? If you want to look at the assets, yeah, okay, so that's a, that's a, good, a good idea. We could, but that, that right-hand side balance sheet is the consolidation of the government and the non-banks. So it's like putting us all in one pot. We own the government. It's just a way to make things simple for you, okay, because you could have them separate. But you're right, so we actually see something up there. Bank notes held by non-banks, dynamite. So, but is that the only place that you can find it in this, in this picture on the balance sheet? of the balance sheets. Whose liability 
or banknotes, yeah. Is it an essential bank credit? Yeah, that's it right there. It's exactly the same entry, which is trying to convince you that this is a double entry bookkeeping system. All the stuff we're using, we think it's valued and valuable is only valuable because there's somebody else on the other side that has some credibility, right? I can, I can claim that I have millions of dollars, but if I can't prove it to you, then I don't have it. And this is kind of the bookkeeping entry that shows that the money's there. It represents some cumulative savings that I've done in the monetary unit, and it's parked at this bank, or in a sense, it's a claim on the central bank. And I don't own a piece of the central bank, but I own a claim that the central bank in the old days, treated as senior in terms of gold. So in the old days, we could actually take the banknote and go to the bank and ask for silver or gold for it. Those days are long gone. But that kind of shows you how credibility is part of the story. Right? So I see a lot of you are very interested now, as opposed to Ramsey. <laughs> it's fine, <laughs> because this is really relevant. A lot of people don't get this. right? <laughs> So um, thank you for paying attention, right? You can see there's some other stuff up there which is also interesting, like deposits of government. The government also has to do its business. It pays me my salary, and it debits some bank account that it has with a commercial bank, the Sparkasse of Berlin, Volksbank, whatever, okay? Not the central bank. Once I was, when I was in Seattle, I got paid by the Banque de France. I got a... I got a check on the Bank of France, which was kind of special. It's like a different type of money, <laughs> but it's just money. I paid it in, uh, they gave me cash, and then I said au revoir, right? It was over. I could have actually paid it to my bank account and they would have accepted it and they would have deposited it. As you can see, um, the commercial banks have liabilities of the central bank on their balance sheet we call those bank reserves, because every bank, every commercial bank has to have some cash on hand or reserves that they can pay out in case a lot of people on that day come and say, uh, dame, uh, give me the money, I gotta go do something with it, which can, that's what banks do. So banks are, you know, this, these are not like stagnant pools, there's a lot of stuff happening every day with the banks. And this is a snapshot at the end of the year, if you like, at the end of the day. Okay, so you see there's a lot of action here, and the M1, we call money, from my, from my perspective, M1 is cash held by you, the public, and the firms, and in most countries, the government, plus bank accounts at commercial banks. Okay, so that red stuff appears twice. It's double entry bookkeeping. It's the liability of the banking system, considered to be the sum of the central bank, and the, more importantly, the, the commercial banks, and on the asset side, it's what we own. So what we own is what they owe, in some sense, in some accounting sense. And that's what we use as means of payment. That's what we're using. It's a stock. So take a look at those balance sheets. Make sure you understand. And it's very complicated, you know, how this money comes about. How does it get created? That's something you might have learned as an undergraduate. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time doing it. But it's about the credit activities of the banking system. The banking system creates the credit, and the credit is held by us, by us collectively as deposits. It's a fascinating process, because there's always an opportunity for a bank to find someone who's patient enough um, and wants to lend the money, and someone who's impatient enough and wants to borrow it. And sometimes you can even make loans without having enough reserves, and you have to go refinance it by going somewhere and finding a a lender, but that's the way the banking system works. This is not about money and banking, but you should understand that you're masters, yeah? Yeah. Uh, so does any consist of the red cells? The red? Cells in general. Yeah, it's, it's, tw it's one half of the sum of the red cells. So if you look at the left-hand oh. side, it's the asset side, that's the, and the right-hand side is the liability side. Okay, so it's just, it's a mirror, um, the image problem. So since we're not using gold anymore, we're not using cryptocurrencies, these things will always appear twice. Cryptocurrencies, not so important anymore. Even when they were important, it was like 1% or 2% of the money supply, not really that important. Gold, in its heyday, was very important. It doesn't have a counter entry in the balance sheet of any bank because it's not created by banks. It's what we call outside money. So we don't, 
use that very much anymore, but it's one way of thinking about it. Most of the money we use today is inside money. Inside meaning it's a liability of some bank or the central bank. Okay? So this uh, figure should occupy you for a few minutes, even though it's not mathematical. There's a lot of, a lot of accounting behind it, and it's double entry bookkeeping. It's just a way of keeping track of things. But it's really important because in the background you can see the central bank has control over the banking system. The central bank lends money. It lends to the banking system so they can make loans to us. That's how it happens, right? And uh, th th that's not because the central bank is nice. It's their job, their job. In the old days, like 300 years ago, central banks actually made money for their own account. They were owners of the central bank. And now I think only in Hong Kong do they have private banks running the monetary policy of Hong Kong, which is kind of unusual. Usually the government says, hey, it's like a pretty good profit source for us. <laughs> Why don't we just take it over? Right? It always happens. OK, so why does money uh, matter? Um, it's just a, if you think it's just a claim on some other institution that we, we tend to accept. I mean, if you try to pay for your rent in uh, peanuts, you're not going to do very well. But if you pay for it in a, in a claim on a bank that's recognized, it's going to be accepted. right? You know, maybe you can do the peanut deal, but you probably won't get away with it. It would be kind of like barter. OK? So the Jevons uh, four uh, are important, but they don't really tell you what money does. Money, what money does is it gives us utility, and it, this utility will depend on the confidence that the means of payment will be used in the future. So I will show you a little model where that makes it very clear. So the, the value of money is, in a sense, the confidence that we have that other people will accept it um, if we accept it. So we accept it because we think others will accept it. So it's, a, it's, a, it, it's this transactions medium function that we're going to focus on first. OK, so it's, a, it's an asset for us because we're spending the money. It's accepted as a means of payment. It's valued by the agents. It's dominated because there are other things we could do with our money, right? I mean, you don't take, if you have a stipend, you don't take it and put it under your pillow, right? In the good old days, when interest rates were positive, you would take it to the bank and get interest. Even now, um, the banks are trying to take lots of money from you, but you still, you know, the chances are very good that before this course is over, interest rates are going to be more positive than they are right now. So you'll, more and more you'll see that, that holding money has a real opportunity cost to it. I could be doing something else with my money. So it's dominated by assets that have a positive yield. For people who have lots of money, um, the opportunity cost might be buying a house or a building that's going to appreciate in value, any sort of asset that yields something that's better than nothing. Okay, So that you can see there's a, there's a tension. The means of payment, the convenience, is fighting against this disadvantage with respect to yield. And that's a, that's a, that's a fa fantastic running problem with, with money. It's a problem, but it's also the reason we need money. We need money, and we're willing to sacrifice the yield so we can, we can make the we can grease the wheels, like, like Hume said. OK, so let's get into some detail. <laughs> there are many reasons why agents hold money, transactions we've already mentioned. So uh, what models could we grab off the shelf to deal with? So one is just, and I'm going to talk about this one first, cash in advance. Anytime I want to buy something, i got to use the money. We're not going to explain why that's the case. Theoretically, you could make a deal with somebody and have a credit, say, OK, can you write it down and I'll come back next week? <laughs> some, some stores do that. Um, um, a lot of friends do that. You know, <laughs> uh, Shoot me alone. Uh, but here we're going to say, what if it's cash in advance? That's easy to understand, and everyone gets that. Cash in advance. There's one of our old friends, overlapping generations. We'll come back to bite us again. It's a, it's a really nice uh, way of thinking about money. A lot of very famous economists have done that. You can actually put money in the utility function. So you say, I'm not really sure why, but I think having some money, unlike Hume, um, we, we're going to say money itself gives us indirectly utility because it saves us the worries of having to run around and, and find someone who wants to buy our stuff, the stuff we're making or the services you're rendering. Okay, So that's, we're going we're gonna to do that later. We're going to actually write down a simple model where you have utility over real money. So the money 
corrected for its purchasing power. Because having 10 million euros is, is nothing unless you know the price of goods you can buy with those 10 million euros, right? And if, if you don't believe me, uh, <laughs> Google Zimbabwe, you know? Um, maybe next time I'll bring you a couple of banknotes where you know, two trillion Zimbabwean dollar banknotes could buy you two eggs at the height of the hyperinflation there. And that's not an accident, right? And Mugabe actually said three or four years before that happened, I'm going to print money to pay my employees because I don't have any tax revenues. Right? He said, uh, my people have to eat. I'm going to pay them with money that I'm going to print up. He actually said it on, in public. And sure enough, three years later, we have hyperinflation in, in, um, in Zimbabwe. Yeah? Um, a currency like that, for example, two trillion something, does it always mean that hyperinflation is the reason that the currency is like that? It is the, the definition of getting there because we'll see in a second, you can think of the inflation rate as the way of moving from one price level to another. That's, a, that's the definition of inflation. So if you put in lots of high inflation rates, the end point is going to be a very high price level. I'm going to show you Turkey. I know. I, I will convince you that it is the reason. Because <laughs> I have data starting in 1960 and ending in 2019. So that's like 60 years of, of Turkish economic history in one table. You'll love it. I'm glad I did this. I did this just for the Turkish students because I know they're very interested in inflation for very good reasons because inflation is very high. And it's the reason why this course is popular because we have uh, several lectures on inflation. It is not over with. And in Germany, you know, Germany inflation rate is 10% now. So for Germans, that's very painful. You know, it's all a relative thing. So um, we'll get there. Just be patient. You can also say that spending money a lot actually causes you to burn up resources. So you know, running from one shop to the other is expensive in terms of your shoe leather, but it also may cost GDP. You may actually waste GDP just trying to track these things. And this is a, a lot of people in Latin America would agree with that statement. You know, just having a whole department of people just tracking the dollar exchange rate. What a, what a waste of resources if the price level were as stable as the dollar then you wouldn't have to do that. That's, that's an idea. And you can also say that uh, maybe monetary policy has an effect because not everybody can borrow from the central bank. Only certain banks can borrow from the central bank, and then they can give credit. Maybe they don't give credit. So there are other ways of it. I'm going to go real simple on you right now. Okay, I'm gonna, we're going to look at the cash in advance idea, and it's just a simple equation. So this is... When I was a teenager, I went to a cocktail party with my parents. It was like one of the first times I got to drink, you know. And uh, this, this um, older guy came up to me and started telling me about economics. So I, I knew nothing about economics. And he wrote down this equation, the Cambridge equation. And it is so simple. It is so seductively simple that I said, wow, this is, I'm going to do physics instead. You know, this is, this is trivial, right? And he was so convinced that this is the right way. Well... It's not as trivial as you think, but it is kind of, it's kind of understandable, and that's why it's worth at least spending 15 minutes to talk about, because the University of Cambridge was populated by really smart people, including Jevons. Um, I think at some time they were all writing down this equation and saying this is the way to figure it out. Okay? In a sense, it's almost like a tautology. So if you have GDP, why? Uh, real GDP, goods and services in terms of some constant price index, uh, some, some sort of uh, measured in sort of constant currency units of some base year. And the price level is the, the leftover, taking nominal divided by real uh, is the price level, then the demand for money is simply P times Y. You need P times Y every period. And you could make it a multiple of that too. Maybe, maybe money is spent more often because M is a stock and PY is a flow. Right? So you're, you're measuring how much of the flow can I pay for with M uh, per, per period. Here we're saying one time. Okay, so if you're willing to extend it and say, well, let's, let's define something called V, 
which is just a, a filler. It's just a tautological definition. It's just the number of, it's kind of the number of times money is spent um, in a period, right? You could, you could look at look, look that. It's the, um, you could call it the, the velocity, and that's why V is easy to remember. So this is such a simple equation, but I still have to write it down because many of you may not have seen it as a bachelor, okay? So this is the this is so-called Cambridge equation. This is a definition of V, and therefore it's a, it's a tautology. So it's, it's true by definition, okay? And think of, think of V as really being uh, the number of times uh, the stock of money gets spent. But you know, it's the end of period stock of money. Maybe it's the average period of, uh, the average stock of money over the period. It's, a, it's always a little bit tricky. Uh, in a, an economy like Turkey, M is growing, PY is growing. You have to understand which time in, in, the, in the year you're looking at. So maybe you want to look at months instead, but you don't measure GDP in months. It's all very tricky. Still, we can think about it. Because I can get those numbers. I can get those data every year. So this is only a useful equation to explain stuff if V is stable. At the very best, it would be constant. And then we have a mechanical relationship between P, M, and Y. Right? It, it has to be true. So you know, suddenly we're in the, in the causation statement world. We're asking, is this really a causal relationship? Well, um, if you think V is constant, I can always divide both sides by V, and I have a demand for money. That's a demand for money. Demand for money is a positive function of GDP in real terms. The richer I am in terms of my wealth uh, creation or value-added creation, the more money I'm going to want. Holding price is constant, but if prices go up, I'm going to ask, I'm going to demand more money. Holding GDP constant. And if V goes up, what happens? I'm spending it faster every unit period, so the demand for money goes down. If I spend money less rapidly, V is lower, the demand for money is higher. So it's a really uh, trivial but quite deep uh, way of understanding what, what money should be doing. Money should scale with the size of the economy, and money should scale in some sense with the price level, because what really matters is the purchasing power. So we talked about Turkey. Um, when they cut the zeros off, off the, the currency, they didn't just cut the, the prices, they cut the money supply. They cut everything. Your pay was cut. And when we changed from the, the D-mark to the euro in 1999, 2002, um, they changed my salary. But it had no real consequence because all the prices and all the wages, all the bank accounts, everything was scaled by the, by the same amount. It's kind of a statement of monetary neutrality. It's literally the denomination of economic activity. And in Zimbabwe, at some point there, you know, the price level is five million times higher than it was in 2008 or in, as it was in 2005 then it's, it may not say anything about the real standard of living in Zimbabwe. It may just say something about the price level and the money supply and, and all other nominal uh, de denominated assets. Okay, but you know, if, you, if you take that seriously, you can flip this equation. So this is where people make a mistake. They say, well, well let's, just, let's use that as an ex explanation of inflation. Okay, in fact, they'll say period by period. You know, the money supply is high, price level must be high. That is not true unless V is constant. And believe me, V is not constant from year to year. 100%. Okay? So that, so that trashes the simple Cambridge equation expla explanation of inflation. And, ex and a lot of investment bankers would say, look, this inflation it's, it's clearly a, a consequence of, of expansionary monetary policy. You can't make that conclusion unless you know something about the rate, the rate at which people are spending money because in the periods of high money growth, V was going down. People were hoarding money. The banks were not lending money. Okay, so all these things were, so you know, V is kind of like a moving part you have to understand. So a good theory will help us explain V as well as the other ones. You had a question? It's behavior. So I'll just, I'll just right now, we'll, we'll explain it later. It's behavior. It's, it could be the households. It could be the firms, right? Um, 
under certain conditions, they might want to spend their money more rapidly, or they might want to spend it less rapidly. Again, it's very mechanical, but it's already pretty, it has a high marginal product of, of intelligence to get this equation right. You know, if you understand that, you can understand where a lot of people are coming from, and then you have to explain, well, you know, maybe V isn't constant, maybe it moves in a certain uh, cyclical way, and that may also help us understand inflation, but for the most part, this is really a long-run statement, and that's why this lecture is called Money and Prices in the Long Run, because in the long run, this does work. Okay, because in the long run, V is actually pretty stable. It's moving over the business cycle, but it's not moving a lot in the long run. And I'm going to use Turkey as a way of proving that. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm using IMF data, you know, so it's got to be right, <laughs> um, because the IMF knows about these zeros, and they cut everything down in the year they, they knocked off the zeros. But the claim that money doesn't matter, it doesn't disturb the real equilibrium, is the statement of monetary neutrality. And I tried, already made that statement with respect to the euro. When the euro was introduced, I woke up one day and I went to the bank and I got euros instead of Deutsche Marks. My pay was cut in terms of a number, but the, nothing had changed really. The purchasing power of the, the new euros was a, exactly the same. Some people said, oh, they raised their prices. Some people raised their prices. Some people cut their prices, but the inflation rate overall did not change. That's good news. It's good news for me, because I've been preaching monetary neutrality 20 years in the past. So the model is OK, right? You had a question. Yeah, when you say V uh, is somehow a basis for behavior, is it just household behavior? Or no, I said firms. Uh, so household and firms use the money. The government also uses the money, but the, the government's kind of. Yeah, I was thinking about the government. So right. They use it somehow to just. Uh, yep, that's right. The so if you want to, if you want to add the government, I have no problem with that. But you have to, you have to model it. You have to model what motivates the government to spend more rapidly, and when I say spend more rapidly, I mean use the means of payment more rapidly in terms of its spending goals, and maybe use some other alternative of holding wealth. Because, you know, you don't want to change your behavior. When I say when I mean like getting rid of money, I mean you're sort of you might be putting it in the bank more often and holding less of it, or you might be putting it in the bank uh, more frequently and holding more of it. And the same is true of governments. So it's really a, a behavioral trade-off with respect to some other asset, okay? Um, in high inflation environments, then people are actually just trying to buy goods. So everything is like, because there are no nominal assets. Everyone's just trying to buy uh, eggs <laughs> or you know, wood for their fireplaces or something. So that, the price of that stuff is rising very, very fast. But we'll, we'll get we'll get there. Any other questions about this? So this is you know this is all. I've spent a lot of time talking. I see a lot of you guys are online now, reading reading the newspaper, the sports. Terrible event yesterday for Germany. I cried, sort of. <laughs> they deserved they deserved it. Um, I, mean, I think it's great Japan is advancing. So I'll add some commentary to this. <laughs> otherwise drab uh, lecture, but I, I want to excite you about money because it's really important, right? It's, uh, we're gonna, this is the way we understand central banks. How do we understand central banks? Central banks have a monopoly on the creation of the hardcore money, right? The banks can create money using uh, the hardcore money as, as reserves, but ultimately the central bank controls everything. And the central bank can also control the interest rate that gives banks access to this stuff. So to get there, we have to understand uh, the simplest models of money. So I'm gonna, now I'm going to use a little bit of math to show you how you go from the, this Cambridge equation to an inflation equation. Okay, so use calculus. Take logarithms of the velocity equation first, natural logarithms. Natural logarithm of the product is the sum of the logarithms of the pieces of the product, right? You know that from math. Uh, I, went I went from this to that. And logarithm is key for us, very important. You all know that. Now, what is the derivative of the logarithmic function, the Napierian logarithm? What's the dx, ddx of ln x? It's 1 over x. 
And if you have dx on the top, if, it's, if you write it as dx over x, it's the rate of change. So it's kind of a neat interpretation. A small change in the logarithm is like a percentage change, except it's divided by 100. Right? To get a percentage, you have to multiply it by 100. So this is a, if you want to move from this world into the, the world of rates of change, for small changes, just take the derivative with respect to time. OK? There it is. Now suddenly, I have a bunch of stuff that I recognize, because if you do the derivative, you know, the derivative of the log of p with respect to t is 1 over p times dp dt. That's the small change in t, in a small change uh, in, in, in time, divided by p. And that's the inflation rate. So the left-hand side is inflation. The second term is what? It's the growth rate of the money supply. It's dm dt divided by mt. That's the rate of growth of the money supply for very small changes. So the great thing about calculus is you can take, hi there, you can take really small changes, right? And you can also approximate it by big, big chunks of time. The last term is the growth rate of the economy, the real economic growth, GDP growth that everyone pays attention to, not the nominal GDP, but the real GDP, the stuff that makes us feel better. Now, where's V? Yeah, it's constant. If you differentiate a constant with respect to time, it's zero. So it's gone. So this is a Mickey Mouse theory of inflation, but pretty good. I'm going to show you that it's not so stupid. It's a good long-term theory of inflation. OK? So pi is our symbol for inflation. From now on out, no matter what course you take, Professor Reinke, my own courses, pi is one of the universal constants in economics for macro. Uh, sometimes in micro, they use it for profits. Not micro, micro. Um, mu, mu is the growth rate of money. <laughs> and G is the growth rate of, the, of GDP, the real economic growth rate. So that's a really cool equation. But it all presumes that V is constant. And if V is not constant, it doesn't work. So I'm going to make an argument that it's probably a, a decent approximation of the long run. But in the short run, uh, we're going to need to think about other things. Okay, so, so inflation is not just about monetary growth. It's monetary growth relative to real growth. So if you look at China, you know, one of the big miracles of the past 50 years is Chinese economic growth is unbelievable. And you can see it in the data. And you can see it in the welfare of people in China um, has improved enormously in terms of material well-being. Okay, because I grew up in a time when there were people starving in China. Okay, in the 1960s and 70s, they had starvation, right? Problems. No one talks about that anymore, but it was a problem, just like in India. So real growth has helped them. If you look at their money supply, it's also grown like crazy. And if you didn't believe that G was important, you'd think China has, has a hyperinflation, but they don't. In fact, that money was allowing Chinese economic growth to flourish and to prosper. It's one way of thinking about it. That's the implication of the Cambridge equation. OK, everybody get that? Fun fact. So final sales is what we call GDP. So you might say, well, you know, this is not a great theory because, in fact, money is used for intermediate transactions. That's a good point. So one, one, one of the problems with this theory is that we don't have a good measure of how many transactions are taking place the value of all the transactions is not recorded. I mean, you can try to make this, make this up or try to track it, but the, the GDP statisticians calculate final sales. C plus I plus G plus X minus Z equals Y. And that's final transactions. So if Volkswagen buys some stuff from a supplier and pays for it with money, and then puts it in their cars and sells the cars. Only the cars go into GDP. The intermediate transactions don't. So in a sense, maybe uh, we shouldn't be using that G, but some G for final transactions. But we don't, for, for intermediate total transactions, we don't have those data. So we have to kind of wing it. All right, so keep that in mind. OK, so now I'm going to try to get concrete for a second. I'm going to try to be real specific. 
I'm going to look at, um, did, we used continuous time until now because dt, dt is kind of a small change in t. Now we're going to take chunks of t going from t plus 1 to t plus 2 to t plus 3. And we can define an inflation rate that way too. We just need to have two observations of p. We need to have a p t plus 1 and we have a need to have a p t. So you can get these numbers from the you know, national statistics or you can go to the go to um, Fred, you know, you can look them up and you can calculate them. So delta is the symbol for change. There's no logarithm in he here anymore, right? But it, it's, a, if, if the delta is smaller and smaller, you can, the logarithm of approximation is pretty good. In fact, it, it's, it's really good. We always use that. So one way of calculating inflation rates for monthly data is just take the log of all the price indexes and then take first differences as you go through time, okay? So if you take other courses, you might do that. Now, somebody asked about the level of prices. Well, you can actually just use inflation to get at the price of the future. This is maybe obvious to most of you, but I have to say it. If you take P in period T and P in period T plus cap T, uh, something happened in between, right? <laughs> and that's what we call inflation. And inflation can be, can be positive, right? So if PT plus 1 is greater than PT, we have positive inflation. If PT plus 1 is below PT, we have negative inflation. And sometimes it's called deflation. <laughs> Fun fact. Um, what matters is the end point. So you know, it, when you look at this stretch, you can see that things may have gone up and down. Maybe, maybe there was negative inflation for a while. So even in a country like Turkey or you know, Egypt, there were periods when the inflation rate was very, very low, but what matters is the end point, and you have to have gotten there. So inflation is always going to be an average over many periods, many small periods or many big periods. So right now in Germany, everyone's crying and scared about 10% inflation. That's reflecting a lot of activity in the price level in a few months when the price of gas went up really fast. It hasn't come down yet. If it, went, if it were to come down again, and if it went negative relative to its initial condition, we'd actually get much closer very quickly to, to low inflation. But because that very sharp increase in gas prices and energy prices that are so important raised PT, and it's not coming down, we're going to see that inflation rate for a long time until we get to a point where we're on a higher plateau. Okay, I'm saying that just because a lot of people don't get that. It's like when an anaconda, anaconda swallows a donkey you can see it for many, many months. It's just in the snake. It's just there. You know, and the snake has to digest it. It takes a long time. Right? But eventually, it'll be gone, unless it happens again. Or <laughs> unless the price starts rising for other reasons than the initial shock. So that's one of the things that ultimately we'll learn about in macro models is that what matters is why people keep raising prices, not just one time, but many times because they maybe expect it to happen in the future. OK, so you can see that the, inter the, in the intermingling of inflation rates in the future with a, a long-term future price level, they're all, by definition, connected. right? So always think of the inflation rate um, as a way of connecting the dots. How do you go from PT to some distant PT? And those inflation rates could actually be negative. You could have negative inflation. Okay. So if you take logarithms of that product I had before, remember the logarithm of a product is the sum of the logarithms of the pieces of the product. Right? I, I keep saying that for a reason, <laughs> because it's important. Okay? So if you take log, you get this mess, and you say, now how do I get to inflation? Well, um, you know, if pi t is small, the log of one plus something that's small is equal to something that's small. It's another fun fact about logarithms. These are fun facts that you really should write down. Okay, The log of 1 plus epsilon is approximately equal to epsilon. And there it is. It's called the logarithmic approximation. And for that reason, we'll often take models that are very complicated, and we'll take a linear approxima approximation of the model in the logarithms so it, it, it's a good approximation for small changes, but when they get big, maybe not such a good change. Okay.
So that's a frequently used approximation for lots of stuff. If you become a consultant when you grow up, you might want to use that. It's very, very quick. You know, it's, it's also very easy to impress your colleagues that you remember uh, logarithms. <laughs> it's really important, okay? All the time in macro. I promise you, you'll see it again. Okay, so let's think about Hume. Hume said any particular country, it doesn't matter how much money they have, what matters is what they can do with it. And he was thinking about Spain with all that gold, but you can think about other stuff. I mean, he was talking about gold, but actually the neutrality idea is simply that the quantity of money doesn't matter in terms of well-being. Okay, so I, I keep saying that, but there's a reason for that. So we're gonna define monetary neutrality as the proposition, because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a hypothesis, okay, that the quantity of money has no direct impact on real outcomes, uh, including, um, including all things that are denominated in the monetary unit. Okay, so it's like a veil. It's often said money is a veil. This is a, another way of saying money is neutral. It's a monetary neutrality hypothesis that we have to pay attention to. Okay, so I'm gonna take it seriously because if you take it seriously, it also means that you can separate the monetary sphere, which we've already discussed, the central banks lending to banks and banks lending. All that is kind of creation of money, but in the, in the long run, what matters is what we do with those loans and those, uh, those uh, credits that we get and how we spend them, that's what really matters. So this, this is something I'm gonna to try to justify with a series of models that would explain why uh, we have something like that in the long run, but not in the short run. Otherwise, we wouldn't pay attention to the, the, the Bundesbank or the, now the, the European Central Bank or the Federal Reserve System. There's a stronger concept, which means that even the rates of change don't matter. So this is, this is actually hotly contested. Um, this would say that even if you speed up the rate of growth of money, as people anticipate it, it wouldn't, it wouldn't affect real activity either. Okay, so that's controversial. It's, not a, it's another hypothesis. It would say that Turkey, with a high inflation rate, is just as well off as it would be with zero inflation or 5% inflation. Okay, it's saying that the real allocation is no different. Very hard to prove that because it's hard to roll back history and give Turkey a different monetary policy than it had in the past 60 years. We can't do that, but we can, we can write down models and we can test people's behavior. So here's some evidence on the long run. I'm trying to convince you now, um, and I'm gonna use Turkey in a, in a table in a second. This is for 167 countries, monetary growth and inflation. The first uh, panel and the second panel is exchange rate depreciation and inflation differential with respect to the United States. Okay, so the first, the first uh, figure shows that countries that have had high monetary growth percent per annum measured properly, because you only, if you take endpoints, you gotta, you gotta do it compounded, because if you have 80% per year, that leads to huge increases very quickly. Remember the doubling rule? <laughs> so you can figure that out, right? So if, if you're compounding continuously, uh, things can double extremely fast. So you wanna do this properly. Still, you have some deviations. On the left-hand side, you have severe devi deviations. Those are usually countries that either had rising inflation or collapsing economy, civil war. Some of those are civil war countries where the GDP has collapsed and um, inflation has increased. Zimbabwe is a good example of a country that had a supply crisis because of some agricultural problems and the government lost all its tax revenues and just started printing money. So there are lots of different reasons why you'd be deviating from a diagonal but it wouldn't always be a diagonal because we have economic growth as well. So countries that have grown high, like China or India, will be different relative to the diagonal than a country that's stagnant or maybe just growing at, at some 2% per year. Okay, so this, this, to, to do that correction, you'd have to subtract some correction uh, from, from money growth of the rate of growth of the economy. So those countries in the lower um, the southwest corner of the diagram would be countries that have really booming economies like China or India or uh, Vietnam um, that have done extremely well because at a given rate of inflation, they just need more money 
to finance their growing economy. And co economies that had some problems uh, would be in the, up, in the, in the north uh, west corner. And the exchange rate idea is simply a corollary of that, because exchange rate is simply the price of your money in terms of other monies. And if you've got a lot of inflation, believe me, your exchange rate is not going to be doing so well, because no one's going to, you know, th things are going to be very expensive um, to buy goods in that country if you don't adjust the exchange rate. So that's just an intuitive way of understanding the exchange rate depreciation rate matches the inflation uh, over 50 or 60 years. This is, a, this is only for 30 years. Here's, a, here's some evidence that it actually works for low inflation countries too. Well, maybe a little bit of a deviation, but the deviation could be due to the fact that some countries are growing faster, some countries are growing slower. That actually works for this picture as well. And at the top you have Greece and Portugal because in this sample they, these countries had their own currency for a long time and they had high inflation and they had high rates of um, monetary growth. And one of the reasons they joined the euro is to, is to tie their hands to stop them from doing that. Right? Ultimately, that's another way of thinking about it. And the exchange rate depreciation uh, matches even better. So here's Turkey. So my friend from Turkey in the back, here's your, here's your graph. It's not even a graph, it's a table. Okay? So in 1960, the IMF takes the price index, and this is a CPI, Consumer Price Index in Turkey, and normalizes it to 100. In 2019, that same number is 434 million. Okay, so the price increased in terms of brute force percentage change, 4.3 million percent. It's quite a bit. The money supply, using 100 as a base in 1960, was 5.3 billion. So someone was making a lot of money. I don't mean earning a lot of money, I mean printing a lot of money, creating a lot of money. So this includes the adjustments you mentioned because when you put those back in, this is what happened. They cut a couple of zeros off, but it didn't make too much of a difference. Okay? Total percentage change, 53 million percent. That's a lot of percent. So that's not the way to do this. You have to do compounding. So you have to take the 60th root of one plus some growth rate to get the last column, which is the compounded rate continuously of price growth 29.6% per year. So in Turkey, we have 100, maybe 90% inflation right now. So they're higher, but in the 90s, inflation was very low in Turkey. So you had highs and lows. The money supply grew by 35% per annum on average, sometimes much more, sometimes much less. But using geometric averages, Okay? It's not the same thing as an arithmetic average. It's, a, it's accounting for compounding because every year, if you're growing like that, you're going to be growing even more because you're growing on the growth. It's compounded growth. 35.2%. Those are actually pretty close. And look at growth. This was a great run for Turkey. Turkey's had, Turkey overtook Egypt in this period. Okay? Turkey actually got richer than Egypt in this period. 4.7% per annum. Try growing at that rate in industrial countries. It's not easy. This is the solo model at work because Egypt invested a lot. They, got, they imported a lot of investment, but they also did a lot of homegrown investment. 4.7% per year means you double how many years? <laughs> you go figure it out. So Turkey did extremely well. And if you don't believe that, you know, go visit the country. They're actually economically... Now, what is the real rate of economic uh, growth in that country? Almost 5%. What is the real growth rate of real balances in that country? 5.6%. So the difference between those is, is virtually zero. I mean, it's a very slow growth or change in velocity. It's consistent with the Cambridge equation. It's incredibly consistent with the Cambridge equation. So for this egregious example of a country where inflation is actually rising now again, you still get um, pretty much some evidence that price, money, and GDP growth are kind of correlated. I haven't said what caused what, whether it was the money supply causing everything or whether it was the price shocks, but getting a, a price shock of 434 million is kind of unusual. Something else had to be going on. Okay? So this is a great table to look at, stare at, try to convince yourself, and understand what compounding 
what compound growth does to you. Because when, you, when, you're, when your price level is growing at 30% per year on average, then it's going to double every two and a half years, or two and a point one six years, right? That's the doubling rule. Great application. Any questions about that? So, in the last few minutes, yeah, go ahead. Is that then kind of the cost of letting Turkey grow so fast that they just use a lot of money to grow? And no, no, that's that's not the way we learned economic growth in the solo model. We know this, the fundamentals of economic growth are capital, labor, technology. Egypt, uh, Turkey had strong population growth, but they had very fast growth in the capital stock, and they managed to modernize themselves in a way much faster than the Netherlands or, or, the, or Germany or the United States. So they're, they're kind of moving closer to the frontier of economic development. Why, why did they use so much money? Then? Why did they print so much money? That's a different question. Well, what do you think? What does our Turkish friend think? Or anybody from Turkey? I mean, does anybody have a clue? But money doesn't produce goods and services. Money is the means of payment. This is what macroeconomics is all about. Money is not a substitute for capital. Maybe for savings for an individual family, but not for creating wealth in a country. Yeah. Um, inflation does make it more attractive to invest your money, not to hold it. And so it would maybe lead to capital accumulation. That's possible. That, that will actually come possibly come out of a model we'll look at later. but. Uh, this is much, much simpler than that. Who is creating the money? Yeah. Just to pay for, cap for more capital? Well, uh, first off, answer my question. Who is creating the money? Central bank. And who does the central bank belong to? The government. More or less. We say it belongs to us, but it actually belongs to the government. <laughs> because belonging means control. So if the government can make the central bank uh, print a few extra liras to pay for the uh, civil servants, then it'll do that, right? And if the government runs a deficit, it borrows from the central bank. It, used, it Go back to the balance sheet, and you see that one of the big items on the central bank's balance sheet, asset side, is loans to the government. So the government hits up the central bank for a loan, uses the proceeds to pay the employees, and suddenly we have more money in the system. And if you do that for several years, that leads to problems. Right? So it's really, you have to put the blame on the central bank because these, these hyperinflations or high inflation periods are not accidents. They're not like, you know, oh, accident. Somebody decided to do that. Some politician or politicians decided to do that. Everywhere, you look at Serbia, you look at Germany in the Weimar Republic, you look at Zimbabwe, somebody always took some decisions to go to the central bank to create money. Yeah. At some point, uh, the government is going to collapse, or uh, how can it pay back the loans? Well, usually there's a there's usually a, a problem. Yeah, like Zimbabwe had a people stopped using the Zimbabwean dollar. They started using the, the South African rand, or they started using dollars. But to get those things, how do you get how do you get rand into the country? This is the crazy thing. How do you get rand? If people you start using rands instead of Zimbabwean dollars, how do you do that? You have to sell stuff. Yeah, you have to export more than you import. So you're actually running a surplus so you can get some means of payment so your people can actually grease the wheels of commerce. Right? Not, not very efficient. But once you get into that situation, it's the only way out. You have to somehow give up your currency, have a currency reform. That's what Weimar Germany did in 1923-24. They reformed the central bank. They called it the, the Rentenbank. It was, used to be the Reichsbank. So, I mean, it's kind of a name changer, but they also said you cannot lend to the government anymore. That was part of their new constitution, so that supposedly helped. So, that helps. Well, foreign, yeah, foreign investment would mean a, a foreigner would buy your currency so they could purchase some land or build a factory. Yes, that's right. But that's not very popular. A lot of, a lot of people don't like too many foreigners coming and buying up your stuff, 
right? We've seen that in the colonial period. We see it with China today. People don't like that. You know, at some point they say, eh, we'd like to control our own lives. You know, we know that you have lots of money, but you just want to build a road to the mine and back. <laughs> we, want to, we want to have a bit more, free. you know, so, it, I, and that's not a flow. You have to have a flow. You have to have a con constant flow, of, inflow of money. Um, so the investment boom has to last forever. And that's not going to happen either. So. That's why establishing credibility is so important for a central bank. You have to get people use it to use your money, and they have to keep people using your money. So if you blow it, if you ruin your credibility through a high inflation, then it may take a long time to build it back. OK, so I'm going to start, I'm going to start with this, this OLG model to, as a model of understanding uh, where the demand for money comes from. So this is really a cool way of marrying what you've learned already with me and Leopold and other places. Uh, to think about the original idea. So the original idea was not diamond, it was Samuelson. It was actually Allais, Maurice Allais, uh, 1947. Sort of, you know, how do we, how do we understand money? Money is, a, is kind of a, a social contrivance, but it's also a, a lot of belief and a lot of confidence. We've already seen it, okay? It's fiat money. So it's literally, everyone talks about fiat money. It's money, fiat comes from the Latin, let it be, let's just make it, right? Let's do it. And that's the cool thing about these pieces of paper. We use them because the government tells us we have to accept them. Um, and as long as things don't get really unpleasant, we're still, it's just easier to say, okay, thank you, government, we'll do it, okay, we'll do it. We have, we have something we believe that because of the fiat edict, we will continue to use it in the future. And in this model, the young people are the ones who are going to demand the money so they can use it when they're old. Instead of using the capital to finance their retirement, they're going to use their money holdings to, to finance their retirement. Again, this is just a simple trick of thinking to, because the, you know, we're not using the money to produce. And that's why you should always separate capital from money, because money is a way of creating wealth and generating wealth. But the, Capital is the means of production, right? So you can see already the young people, they work and acquire means of payment and then spend it when they're older. So that's exactly what's going to happen. When you're old, you use it to, to pay for your consumption. When your income is zero. OK, so it's just like the, it's just like the model you had before, except there's no production. So it's kind of a way of strengthening your intuition you already have. So Samuelson, in his brilliant paper, he actually made it too complicated. We all figured out parts of Samuelson's model just aren't necessary, so we just chucked it. But Samuelson got the Nobel Prize, and there it is. That's, that's why. Okay? Your utility as a young person is the periodic utility of your youth consumption and the aged consumption when you get old. And then you discount the oldness with beta. Beta is a discount factor. And this is a model with perfect certainty, so there's no uncertainty here. You, you can pretty much calculate how much money do I want to carry into my future. So it's like your house, except now you, you just use it as a means of payment. There's no productive capital in this model, so we just shut that down. You can put it in, but it, doesn't, it, doesn't, uh, it won't change the fundamental findings. Okay? So you, you receive. You, either you work when you're young or you receive a unit of consumption when you're young, but what are you going to do with it? So I give you a refrigerator. <laughs> you can save it. It's durable. But what if I give you a, a loaf of bread? What if I give you um, a bunch of canned goods that only last until you're, until you're old and then you have nothing to eat? So what do you do? Well, you're going you're gonna to try to... Um, try to smooth your consumption. We know that. That's one of the fundamental laws of, of, of macro is that people have concave utility. How do we know that? Well, we kind of assumed it. More, more consumption is better than less, but it gets better at a declining rate. Okay, and that's, and that's why we want to smooth. That's why we want to carry some cash into the future. If we couldn't trade with anybody, we would be in bad shape because when you have no consumption, you're really miserable. That's the assumption. You starve. So every person is going to want to have some cash on hand when they're old so they can buy the goodies from the new young people. It's common sense, right? It's kind of a cool, it's just a, such a cool model. So you write, write down the budget constraint for the young person. 
The young person has one unit of consumption but can't trade, so they're stuck at the green dot. And Samuelson was, 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 was ingenious because he said, look, um, there are young people who have something and there are old people who have nothing. If you don't let them trade, uh, it's not great. You have starving people. And how do we get them to trade? What do the old people have to give to the young people? Nothing. Now, the central planner, what would the central planner do? If you were the central planner in this economy, how would you help the old people? Central planners can do whatever they want. If you're the social central planner, cares about everybody, what would you do? You've got, you've got, you know, you've got people with, with one unit, and then you've got one plus N people with, when they get old, they have no units. So what, what anybody? Yeah, it's, it sounds brutal. You just confiscate it. You, take, you just take some of the young people's stuff and you give it to the old people, right? The central planner would do that because the central planner doesn't want the old people to starve. But there's no way without some means of trade to help the old people. The old people had no chance by construction to plan for their own future. That's, that's when you introduce one of these systems. That's the problem, right? You have a bunch of people who are starving. So, uh, and Samuelson said, well, we don't want to confiscate their stuff. Why don't we devise a system that allows some gains from trade? And if you tell the people who are old when they're young, hey, you can trade with the currently old, so you have to introduce this money at some place, and you give the people who are old the chance to buy the, the stuff from the old. So you don't, you don't tax them. You, you give the other guys a freebie, and that's kind of like a tax because uh, what, what will be the price for which the young people will part with the stuff, well, they'll say, you know, I, I'm kind of desperate because I know I'm going to be old too and I'm going to need, I'm going to need a means of, of saving myself when I'm old. Okay? So that's the, the, the brilliance of this is that for society, the budget constraint looks like this. It's not a point. Okay? And the, the contrivance of money actually allows us to do that. So if you have any sort of normal indifference curves, you make people really well off. Okay? I mean, you really, you're really improving welfare. So, uh, you know, this is true even if you have wastage. So suppose you could actually put the stuff in a, you know, you, you have some consumption, like some cookies, and you put them in the, in the corner of your closet, and when you get old, they're, they're still there. You could eat them, but they're, they're kind of disgusting. Uh, you, you manage to transfer some consumption into the next period, but there's a loss, right? Huge loss, probably a very high rate of wastage. Um, the Samuelson point is still true. Okay, you could do the saving. You'd have a very flat budget constraint as an individual, and every old person would have a bunch of old cookies to chew on, but it would not be optimal, socially optimal. So Samuelson kind of convinces us that, uh, that superior technology is to somehow take, take some resources at the very beginning from people who are young and give them to the old, and that's what happens when you introduce a social security system. You always do that. And then... From that point on, the system is sort of self-perpetuating. Okay, so again, this is a welfare-increasing intervention, and Samuelson shows that, introducing money as a way of enabling uh, trade between generations. But the price of goods is exactly the price of money in terms of goods. So the rate of change of that money supply could actually affect the rate of inflation. It could affect the people's willingness to hold the money because they know Gee, if I, if I sell this old person my, my stuff, I'm going to get money, for, but may not be worth very much in one period, so maybe I'm going to be a bit less interested in doing that trade. Okay, so it becomes, it becomes a different equilibrium as soon as the government is creating the money. So my first initial contrivance was just there's gold out there, and you can use that to trade, and you give all the gold to the old people and the old people spend it on the consumption, and the young people have the gold, and the next period, the young people have the, are old with the gold. <laughs> and when they're old, they spend it, and the young people of the next generation get the gold. See? So it doesn't have to be cash. It can be seashells, but we have to agree. We have to kind of agree to use this contrivance. Okay, there was a question? You had a question? Somebody had a question? No. Okay, so... 
conclude the society can make individuals better off without making anyone worse off. Okay, is that really true? A small transfer, yes. Um, of course, you have to, the first generation will always suffer. The first generation of young people have to pay for the old people who get a windfall. So there's always that issue. But once the system's going, it makes sense to have this stuff around. Okay, you can have a Pareto improvement. Um, especially the young people know that if they don't do that, they're going to suffer. So in some sense, they, they can improve their own lot as well in the second period. And in the diamond model, we already had capital do that. So now we've gotten rid of the capital. We have something else. It works. Samuelson called this a social contrivance because it requires some agreement. We have to agree this is it. You know, we're going to use this instead of this for money. We're going to use gold instead of oil or uh, use money, coins, whatever. So it's, it's, it involves some social engineering. Like I talked about Charlemagne making people accept it. Charlemagne forced people to accept it. You could accept other stuff, but if you, if you refused to accept the livre, the silver livre, you actually got punished. I mean, they, didn't, they didn't kill you, but you had to go, go uh, pay some fine or something. It's pretty interesting, right? So he understood getting the social uh, agreement is important. So we can show this with a very simple example, and I'll stop. So suppose the government now prints the money to do this. The government creates the money out of thin air. So you say, that's not fair. Well, it's the government. The government does a lot of things that aren't fair. <laughs> they tax, and they spend, and they give it to some people, they don't give it to others. Just suppose they do it. Call it H. And we're going to think maybe the younger generation believes, for whatever reason, that this money has some value in the future. We're going to solve for that. But first, they have to get started. They have to accept the, the H in payment, because they have all the goodies. They have all the cookies. Right? And then they want to give some for this stuff to people who are old who have the H. So we can just take this utility function. We've played with this a lot. You can put the log function in there or put some other function. You can, the, the person making the plan has to maximize this subject to a budget constraint. So what is that budget constraint? Well, the young people will demand some money in the period T. And in period T plus one, they'll spend it. And they'll spend it on this stuff, the cookies. Okay? And it's not even the cookies from today. It's the cookies from tomorrow. Okay? And so think of, you know, one minus CT is the, is the amount of money they're not going to, uh, the amount of cookies they're not going to eat. They're going to transfer to the future. They're going to sell it at price T, P, T, and then they will get M, TD, the de their demand for money, and in the second period, they'll spend it on the cookies in the second period. What's the difference? In the second period, the price of the cookies are PT plus one. So that's inflation in between. It doesn't have to be positive. We're going to have to solve for it, but it will be different from PT. So that's the, the price of using the money. Right? Everybody understand? OK, so it's, um, if the price in the second period is not infinity, if you don't have a hyperinflation and the money is worthless, right, then there is some reason for the young people to hold some of the money, to sell some of their cookies to the old people. OK, so it's all about this PT plus 1. OK, so one equilibrium in this model is people don't believe the money will have any value in the second period. And therefore, the, 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 the economy never takes off. You'll always have a real economy. So it's like the end, the end station, the end station of Zimbabwe. <laughs> you know, in the end, people were chasing people and trying to get them to take this stuff, but nobody wanted to take it, right? So if you if you were holding the hot potato, it was your your problem. So you can see this just by inspecting the first order conditions. And the first order condition says the marginal utility of consumption today, given that I have to. Um, pay, f you know, given that I'm exchanging consumption today for, for PT, has to be the marginal utility of consumption tomorrow of buying the stuff at PT plus one. So that new, the new part of this, this equation that you saw before is the appearance of this price level, price of the stuff um, that I'm using to smooth my consumption. It's this 
to grease the wheels of commerce. Okay? Now, if I just flip that around, I end up getting a demand for money. I've got a demand for money. I just have to think of, of if I change the rate of inflation or deflation, what does that mean for the demand for the cash that I have, the amount of consumption I buy in the first period, or the amount of consumption I sell to the old people in the first period, is my money demand. Because if you sell your goods, you sell your cookies, you get some money. So that's a money demand function. And it's a function of the inflation rate. Right? If prices are falling, will I have more or less money demand? If I think prices are going to fall into the next period, More demand. Do you agree? I'm, I'm right? Yeah. Right. Well, if, if PT plus 1 is less than PT, then that thing is, is greater than 1. So you're going to actually want to have more money because you'll have more consumption in the second period because your dollars or your, your H will be worth more in terms of cookies. Right? So when the interest rate goes up, the rate of holding, the opportunity cost of holding money would mean that PT plus 1 is higher, and that thing will be lower, then indeed anything you hold into the future is going to be worth less. You have less real goods, less cookies in the second period. So think of this PT divided by PT plus 1 as the inverse of the inflation rate. And now we have a theory of the demand for money. The higher the inflation rate, the lower the demand for money in real terms today. Because the left-hand side is the real money demand that I have. It's the demand for real balances, we call it in English. Real balances. Adjusting the money supply for, and this can be in the form of bank. You know, In this model, it's just H, whatever H is, paper. Um, but it could be anything. So this is like a very fundamental justification. And the, the interesting thing is you only have one cookie in this model, right? You have this one cookie and you divide it between your two periods of life. But suppose you have GDP, which is growing on its own. So in the second period, you know there's going to be more GDP around. So you're going to have more demand for money. That's going to affect your money demand positively. In, in period now, if I've got a bigger economy, I'm going to have more demand for money. And in the future, I'm going to have a greater demand for money as well. So this is a baby version of the money demand function from an OLG model, starting a really simple, you know, baka, so you've already done this a jillion times, so you already know how to do it. You can also think of this as a savings function because it's the same thing in the Samuelson model. You're saving to, for future consumption using money, but you have an interest rate, which is not the same thing as the marginal product of capital or the rate of return on, uh, on capital. It's, the, it's this deflation rate or put on its head the inflation rate. So remember, money is like a hot potato. In this, money, there's, in this economy, there's only a fixed amount of, 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 of money in there. It's H. It's fixed. Um, so you know, if the government tells you you have to accept the seashells or cryptocurrencies or whatever, and you have to do it, then as long as people believe that the price level is fixed in the future, that's fine. And if H is constant, we can solve for the price level tomorrow. right? Now, the real world is a little bit more complicated than that. But this is basically a simple idea. This says that if the, if the demand for goods is equal to the supply of goods, then the other markets have to clear as well. And the other market is the market for money. It's the money market, the demand for this means of payment. So that's how we rationalize uh, the demand for money. And the money market equilibrium is simply when those things are equal. And if I tell you it's fixed, the real money supply of the old people is equal to the demand for money of the young people. Because the old people have the, you gave the H to the old folks so they could buy your cookies. <laughs> so they could eat. Otherwise, they were going to starve. right? And if that thing is constant, you can literally f find the inflation rate today that's consistent with that equation. And NT is the population growth rate. So I didn't tell you this, but maybe there are more people next year. Maybe, the, maybe people are actually not increasing. Maybe they're shrinking in number. So you have two different possibilities. It will also affect the price level because there are fewer or more people demanding the same amount of money. Okay. 
so we can use those two, um, those two equilibrium conditions um, and get an inflation rate. So this is kind of the, this is the more sort of souped up version. Um, and then you can basically say that a candidate rate of inflation is one that's consistent with uh, demand and supply of money in each period being equal. And you end up getting an inflation rate that is actually the inverse of the population growth rate. So in a, in a world where the money supply is constant, um, the, the growth of the population will be the only determinant of the price level in terms of this monetary unit, unit in fixed supply. So if you were a government, what would you do in a, in a world like that? You're the government, you're, you have the rights to print money as much as you want. And you see the demand for money is growing with population. So what's, yeah, why not? Just print a, print a bit more. <laughs> You could have stable prices, um, stable prices, if you print money at the rate of growth of the population. So it's just a, it's a, it's a simple characterization of this, of this model. Otherwise, prices are going to be falling. You're going to have deflation because you have more and more people coming on, and um, they're getting increasingly desperate. Um, and this is why when you have, OK, last word, when you have gold or silver or a, even Bitcoin as the standard of payment, those supplies are fixed either by law of nature or by law of, of, the, of the blockchain. So if people want more money, the price level has to go down to accommodate that increased demand. Right? So it's a, you're going you're to have deflation. And this is the disadvantage of having the gold standard is because if you're a growing economy, um, you're going to have to get the money from somewhere like like Zimbabwe, you're going to have to export more than you import. You're going to have to either find the gold or you're going to have to deal with falling prices secularly over time. So this is the, the argument that I make and everyone makes in macro against a gold standard. You, you're, you're putting yourself in chains for no good reason. But if you want inflation, the central bank has to sort of overdo it and print more money at a, at a higher growth rate than the growth rate that naturally comes out of the model. OK, so that's the, that's the first seri simple theory of inflation. I'll stop now. Um, and you can see also that people's expectations matter. So if people expect Zimbabwe to happen in the future, people are not going to hold that money. So you can actually fall into a situation where uh, the young people in this model refuse to accept it because they know that when they get old, they're not going to get many cookies for it. Okay, so it's, it's about expectations. Okay, so I'll stop here. Next week, we'll do um, a, a more formal model that says the same story. It tells you where hyperinflation comes from, where inflation comes from. It's going to come ultimately from the originator of money, which is the central bank or ultimately the government. Okay, so have a nice weekend. Today's Friday? Yeah, have a nice weekend.